we're live but i'm going to start giving the description in a moment hi i'm here with youtube Hello. sensation oh. megan the voter <laughs> hello everyone <laughs> i'm and, just posting the link and so, so, go ahead i'm going to be super on topic on this one folks because it's going to be so on topic transcribed by megan's uh transcribing software and um i've got to phrase this as four questions so um uh the, the first one is a three-parter and the first question is what was your upbringing like so lots of detail please Ooh, i get uh, to see the comments oh hi sorry yeah. i was clicked on the wrong thing hi yeah. everyone who's here right so if you give us loads of detail mega mm -hmm. about what, what, your, upbringing what like? your upbringing was like i really like this question um so my let's see so I'm Italian American and on my mom's side, my grandpa moved here in like the fifties and on my dad's side, my great grandpa moved here a little before then. And so whenever I first grew up, uh, it was still very much loud Italian American sort of immigrant culture, lots of family, really close with my cousins, second cousins sort of thing. Um, and uh, how do I want to describe this? Um, I guess the reason I bring that up is because my family is very close and in your face and people will talk over each other a lot and like very extroverted. And for people that, you know, didn't grow up with that, there's a lot of F.E., I guess. <laughs> in just a touch. I remember... I mentioned this to, <laughs> to somebody in Spain, uh -huh. and uh, people say we're extroverted, but we're nothing compared to Italians. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. uh, I mean, people think we're FA, but uh, yeah. yeah, super so expressive. Yeah. It's very like, what would you like for me to cook for you? Like, please eat this food, like, sort of in your face, push it, like, hug, like, when you say goodbye at a family gathering you say goodbye like 15 times and keep hugging like, Oh, sorry. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. There's no, there's no Irish goodbye. I don't know if you hear that phrase. If they say that, um, the Irish goodbye is pretty much just a phrase of you leave without saying goodbye. <laughs> you just sneak out. But anyway, definitely not that. Um, my dad was a politician growing up and I was always told, that I can be whatever I set my mind to. I get, I'm very lucky in, to be close with my family. I grew up um, middle class um, and in like the a suburb of the mid, in the Midwest. And uh, so how do I want to describe this? It's, it was an interesting sort of dynamic because I grew up around lots of lower middle class as well. I definitely did not grow up rich at all, uh, but because my dad was a politician and I was comfortably middle class, um, there was a little bit of people being like, oh, your dad's like the president or something and like, kind of like oh it's the Lavotas, like sort of thing uh going on um but i feel like i was very exposed to like i didn't grow up in a typical sort of suburban bubble i guess um okay suburban but still street i suppose a little bit yeah, I mean, like, one of my best friends lived in a trailer park in elementary school. Right. Um, so I, I guess my upbringing, I, I have a younger sister who's two years younger than me. Um, I kind of was, whenever I was younger, I was kind of spoiled by my grandparents because I was, like, the first kid on both sides of the family as, uh, like, the first cousin. So I got... And my mom was like a stay-at-home mom until 
I was like 10 and um, I was very close with my grandparents. Um, then my sister was born, that was fun. <laughs> Got to have a friend. Um, we get, entertained ourselves a lot. Here, go ahead. How did you get on with your siblings? Um, when good. growing up? So we got along pretty well. There was definitely some bickering, but my favorite thing to do was like playing pretend um, and acting things out. Like me and my sister would play with like Barbie dolls and like come up with this intricate story of like, well, this person likes this person, but they try, they don't like this person because of this. And then we would like act out these whole things. I started doing ballet when I was three and I did perform to the Nutcracker every year uh, until I was like nine. And I really mostly liked the music and the acting portion of that. I didn't really feel dainty enough to be a ballerina, but I liked to like play dress up and stuff. Um, and I, how do I wanna, I started singing when I was eight that's whenever I got into class classical music. Um, I also, I guess I started doing uh, musical theater when I was five. So I was, I guess, a very artistic kid. My, my form of play, which I always would invite friends over to spend the night and stuff, <laughs> um, was always about playing pretend or acting, or I would always try and get groups of kids together to do a play. And I would like write something and then like give them their roles and like try and direct them. Um, I, like whenever I was eight, we always went to like the lake for like a summer vacation with some of my parents, family, friends. And I was the oldest kid and I put on a talent show where I encouraged all the kids to share their talent. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's, let's say we're at age eight now. I really yep. start to love music. I start auditioning for the talent show I did not care, like I didn't care about sports at all, but I also, at this young age, I really did not care what people thought about me either. I was very bold and confident in like being able to perform and stuff. And I tried to encourage my friends to also, people kind of started to make fun of me for that. Um, especially since people would start to be friends with their people from sports teams, basketball teams or whatever. And I felt a little left out. I kind of had a different best friend every year and I kept feeling like I didn't really fit in yet. At the same time, I never really like told myself, well, you should be a sporty person or you should care about this. Like I also looking back, I think a lot of it was that a lot of the people I went to school with didn't have as active as uh didn't have as close of a family as I did. And so looking back, I'm really grateful that I, you know, was encouraged to develop my passions at a young age. Cause really I was just a passionate kind of obnoxious kid. I really cared about pleasing the teacher. I, um, you know, would ask a lot of questions. Um, I guess to continue the upbringing, that sort of pattern happened, you know, I was always, Pretty obnoxious, pretty creative. I kept it, doing mute. I'm trying to get to where I am now, but no, 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 no. how were you not obnoxious? Because you know, Victor might say, "Oh, that's nothing." <laughs> Wait, how was I not obnoxious? No, no. How were you not? I mean, you say you're oh, not okay. obnoxious, but if you give some examples, please. We live in the detail. Honestly, I never thought I was obnoxious. I would hear that from other people. So, and how would that make you feel? really bad i used to i used to watch like movies about um you know best friends and i would like cry that i didn't have a best friend or like i would need to invite a friend over every weekend for like a sleepover and i would like get in arguments with my mom if she like didn't let me no. um had a hard time being alone with my own thoughts for sure um but by the okay by the time we get to middle school it gets a little bit worse because I really want a boyfriend. I really like want to date people and people would say I come on too strong or something. Oh. Um, 
Go this, ahead. This is an interruption, but there's, there's method to the madness of it. Yes. So Go for ahead. Victor, what age mm -hmm. range is middle school? Uh, okay. Um, 11 to 13. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember that um, seventh grade was really hard for me, which I was 12. Because I think really I started to realize how different I felt from everyone around me. And I did not like that. Um, how were you different? I, um, a little bit more inquisitive. A little bit more... Um, I really needed to know why about everything. And so... And also more passionate. More outwardly emotionally needy, I suppose. Um, in my mind, I guess, I mean, I was just really earnest. I really wanted to get to know people. And I felt like at that age, people try and be cool. And I just couldn't really follow that. Like whatever they were doing to try and appear cool and try and dim themselves down or numb themselves really was not working for me. And so... I kind of, but, you know, at the same time, I'm not immune to it either. Cause I guess I would say that to eighth and ninth grade, I kind of started being a lot more quiet in class because I started to think things like, well, these people aren't going to understand me. So why bother? Um, I'll just find the people who do. And I still did things outside of school, like did, um, you know, choir and theater as much as I could. I wanted, I always wanted to keep busy and I always wanted to be creating something. And what, what mm -hmm. do you think they didn't understand about you? Um, that's a good question. So, okay, actually, for example, I think this will answer it is that one of my really good friends in middle school, she kind of, ditched me a lot for someone who she perceived as cooler, who I thought was kind of fake. Yeah. And the, it was just kind of a group of girls that cared a lot more about like how they look and like shallowness and trying to please boys or whatever, where I, I guess I want is I was, you know, 12, 13, but in my mind, it's like I wanted to be really goofy. I wanted to talk about ourselves. I wanted to have deep connections. It's almost like, I guess people thought I was too much or like I wanted to go deeper than what people are willing to go. Or um, like, for example, like I, I would be like nice to guys. Like I would just say, oh, I like your, you know, artwork or whatever. And people would be like, oh, you like him. Oh, my God. And I would be like, no, I just like <laughs> his artwork. And like, I felt like everything I did, people sort of blew it out of proportion or like thought that it was like really intense when I thought I was just talking and like being nice. And I guess my mom always told me I had a good head on my shoulder. And I think that's pretty true that throughout a ch childhood, I, I did have a good head on my shoulder. Like... I both cared about what people thought about me a lot and I cared about the group. Yeah. I also feel like at the end of the day, I didn't really let it change me to my core. And I've always had strong willpower and like wanted to be, um, wanted to be better, wanted to do things I was passionate about. When I got to high school, um, you know, I got more involved Again, I, I met more people that I felt like were more like me. Um, I don't honestly really know how to explain that because, to be honest, I feel like I see the good in everybody. So most of the time when I don't get on with someone, it's because they don't like me for reasons that I don't even know why. And I can always find a reason to like them. And I always just distance myself whenever I can tell that they don't like me. So I never even really think about why. I just... Yeah. Uh, uh, now, a few yeah. minutes ago, you mentioned deep connection. Now, uh -huh. as when people say something like that, 
that's massively important because people are analyzing oh, what does that mean fe fi so if you like if you give lots of details about what you mean about that then that'll be easier for people to assess especially okay, Victor. Deep connection um i don't know like I, I guess i wanted it to feel real like i wanted um I don't know. I would at the time I wasn't like, oh, I need, you know, a deep talk. But like, I guess that's the best way I know how to describe it now is um, let me think, for example, like that's a great way of putting it, Megan. Uh, yeah. What would that mean? What was deep connection mean to you now? Because presumably you still want that. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Um. I want to be able to feel like I can be my full self without that full self, um, you know, bothering the other person or, you know, being at odds with whatever the other person's values are. Like, I want it to be, I guess, like intimacy. I was seeking intimacy, you could say. But I also was seeking the relationship to flow without... Um, people having to change who they are, like um, who they are in their essence, their soul, you could say. <laughs> like, Sam's <as> you would. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm just saying, she's just super NF, so yeah, she would say that, yeah. Um, like, for example, like the friends that I have now that I talk to the most um, I found that it's easier to stay friends with people who already have the same interests as me or the same goals as me because it just flows naturally. There are a lot of people that I really care about that I'll always like hold in my heart. But like if I have a different goal or like if my soul's journey is going in a different direction, then the relationship might not flow. It might feel a little forced or maybe like there's something about me that is triggering to somebody else or, you know, bothers them. <laughs> you know, if they, if they have a hard time, you know, communicating their emotions and they need, cause I kind of expect a lot of emotional communication from people sometimes. And if they have a hard time communicating their emotions, then maybe I'm not just the right friend for them. I can be patient, but I would rather go for the connections that I guess work better. Um, I, so, does that answer it? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to have a little digressive question, but I think it's important mm -hmm. for Victor. So uh, you have siblings. Um, yeah. We, we can sort of like nullify the uh, cultural factor by saying what were you like compared to them mm. in terms of emotional expressivity that's a really good question so i guess whenever i say whenever i say i felt not normal one thing to say i know this might not really affect victor's typing of me but my sister is a esfj in mbti and my sister did sports she did student council she always had a large friend group of her of like her basketball team or like people um i don't know i felt like her it's, it's almost like i felt like my desires in life were too much where my sister was able to be content with the world as it is where i and more passionate about changing the world, I guess. How would you like to? Uh, <laughs> this, this is too too important. It's not part of the official series of questions, but it's massively important. How would you like to change the world, Megan? Um, I think. Um, can I get actually get back to that after I finish what I was saying about my yes, sister? Yes, I have it written down. Um, my sister and I got along a lot better when we were younger. And as we started to grow older, we bicker a little bit more. Um, I just, as far as how we deal with our emotions, um, she always wanted to slam the door 
and not talk about it and move on. And I always wanted to talk through, like if we were in a fight, I always wanted to know what did I do wrong? Like, um, why are you upset? What can I do? And that was seen as like annoying or too much. And so um, that's like, I guess the sort of conflict we had. And I guess part of me resented that it seemed like my sister didn't even have to try and she already fit in where I feel like I have to tone myself down or else people are going to get mad at me for existing or something. Um, but does that answer that question enough? Yeah. Uh, okay. I've got these little subsidiary questions that uh -huh. sort of feed into things that I think uh, are important. Uh -huh. So, uh, so what what do you, what what about uh, this? Uh, so, how would you improve the world? Okay, how would I improve the world? Or maybe how you thought at the time versus how you think of it now. Well, okay. So, whenever I was a kid, I I would ask things like, "There's a dollar store. Why is there not a penny store? Why can't people just go in there and get their basic needs whenever they want? Like, what's <laughs> the point of money? Like, why do we have to judge people off of this? Like, I was very confused by that, and I asked a lot of questions um like that as a kid i would even ask random things like i remember my grandma you know she didn't work i'd be like how do you get money oh social security and i'd say oh well, what social security i can't wait till i get old i can't get social security <laughs> I, and then she would be like it doesn't work that way and i would just like try and fig figure out things like that um but okay as far as changing the world so this is like my thoughts now as an adult is that i feel like human beings have strayed from our essence and with the material world has sort of diluted, like, like with the industrial revolution and everything, um, we're kind of separate from nature more these days. And I guess to change the world, it's about getting every individual, it starts with every individual, like, um, sorry, this is very convoluted, but it's like, um, it, it's good. Because it okay. goes to your motivations. Yeah, it's like I feel like there's a lot of societal norms that really are just aren't working for us. The way the economy works, the way the governments work, there's just a lot of rules that just really aren't working for us that don't really um, fit our ah. essence. What or sort of what our sort of, essence? What sort of? Oh, I'm sorry, every now I interrupt. It's just that you say something that's very, very typologically interesting. What okay. sort of rules would they be, Megan? Okay. I am wrote that down, and I'm going to get back to that, but okay. I want to finish this train of thought, okay. is that um, I guess to, to, to be more natural or to be more one with God or the universe or, like, to feel more aligned with what our destiny is. And I think that there's too many people who don't know their soul, don't know their destiny, they're doing what they think that they should do based on what someone else said or like the rules. And it causes all of this conflict. And it's like, we're separate from ourselves. We're separate from nature. We're separate from the universe. We're separate from each other. We've forgotten that we're all one, you know, but the only way to discover that we're all one and to live in harmony is to go through the path of pretty much the individuation, the path of the individual, know your soul, align your soul with what it really is you know, make decisions based on your, um, um, where <laughs> your heart and your soul wants you to go and not like based on a system that is removed from how hu the human essence, you know, feels or should, um, operate. So I guess, yeah, I think our feelings are numbed too. I think that people are, don't even know what they want. How can you be happy if you don't know what you want? And if you're too afraid to feel, you numb your emotions and then you make logical decisions so that you can, you know, get somewhere. But then how are you going to reach happiness as a goal if you have numbed the emotions, which is the tool that allows you to even know what you want in order to get to a place of actually thriving emotionally? So that's that's kind of part of it. But so rules um i don't like the idea of trading time for money or like us being measured based on our productivity because there's so many um things that humans 
so many valuable things by humans that cannot be measured um, super, you know, straightforwardly. For example, I work in marketing, social media, digital marketing. You can measure how many sales something does, but what, how can you measure how emotional a piece of text made someone feel, how much trust they got from you, how, how much of a connection did you establish with your audience, and what role does that have on the business success? There, there's a lot of just like missing gaps, which I think you know exist in the realm of emotion that are not very easily measured, and so they're ignored. And I think that a lot of times in society, it's just completely taken for granted. People have to do emotional labor for free to get by. Whereas if you are good at executing some sort of logistical thing, then um, you can measure it and then you're valued for it. Um, so that's, that's, part of it. I think, honestly, I think the entire economy needs to change. I think the entire government needs to change. I think we, I'd be cool if we start over from scratch, you know, and I don't say that very often, but I feel like for the typing, then that is probably some information you might need to know um, if that, regarding that, perhaps my quadra. <laughs> that, that's like a whole massive series because, you know, I'm into economics and libertarianism. That was just, that, that's a whole series of events oh, and i yeah. don't really want to want to go there because it's like a whole there's a whole and i guess i should clarify thing. that i'm not like i'm not socialist by any means i just I, I just think that there are some little snags in the system that well, aren't really working well i'll just i'll just i'll just put the thing out so i listen to peter Schiff a lot and what mm -hmm. he would say is and i agree is that the reason the united states economy is messed up is because of the socialism that's already in it hmm. because you've got so for example you've got the federal reserve it messes up interest rates interest rates are extremely important for the intuition of time of ntjs because it's about how much money they can borrow and how long it takes to pay it back and that affects the kind of projects that they invest in and it affects behavior mm -hmm. so that you have people consuming now so the mm -hmm. so someone says say an ntj is uh a gamma nt is having a project where uh, it comes to fruition in five years mm -hmm. and they base that on the demand that they see at present and i think right in five years like this business is going to be ready and this demand will be there but the mm -hmm. demand that they see at the moment is from false signals because that might be because of debt because interest rates are low and it enables people to borrow money and buy stuff. And yet when five, five years future, when you get that five years in the future, everyone's in debt. They can't consume at the present level. So the business person received the wrong price signals mm -hmm. because consumption was stolen from the future because of um, credit. So I think I have just, actually no. a really good example no. of a rule is that I think America's healthcare system is absolutely messed up. Yeah. I want to say a swear word, but I know you don't like <laughs> swear words. But but can I explain yeah. something about this? Is this gets at what I was talking about about how some things are hard to measure. How do you yeah. measure the numerical value of human life? How how do you measure that? And see what I think that in America, what a lot of the private healthcare systems do is they kind of know that you can't put a number on it. And so it's very predatory. They just keep raising the prices. Some people like insulin is like hundreds of dollars a month. So it's like, oh, if you, you have diabetes, you just deserve to die. It's like people but, keep, I guess, let me just explain yeah. my, my point here is that I think that I don't know the answer or the solution, I can point to the problems and I can say that we can find the solution by, you know, uh, allowing ourselves to feel and stuff like that. But the, the problem with America's healthcare system is that it, I feel like is kind of predatory and sort of feeding off of the people with nothing and knowing that 
the hum it's almost preying on the essential human desire to stay alive and saying huh, we could just charge whatever we want like there's no there's no like ethical standard of like like i don't know if you're super familiar with how much it costs yeah, yeah i've it, it's a hell of, <laughs> there's so much stuff to unpack in here for a start some things that we can measure so you know that apple overcharges right that, that they're able to because there's not other people making apple compute by looking at their profit margins what mm. people can look at is look at the profit margins of these insurance companies and to see what they're like if they're like 50 percent or they're like 10 percent or they're like five percent because then you can get an idea of okay this money is not really going in the profit so where is the money going there's so many things to consider with um healthcare one of them is the state legislatures really restrict how many medical health care mm -hmm. choices you can have you are uh, not allowed to buy insurance from switzerland why not if you could buy insurance from all over the world you've got the competition there first thing mm -hmm. massive problem is the tax code so we because have what a comment from someone saying that yeah. i feel like we're going off topic and i agree because i want to make <laughs> sure i can get to right. the point of this video but okay. i i understand it's super complicated but you can even use the fact that i'm not even going into the logistics or something right. to help type me but i know it's not that simple yeah. i just am saying that i think that if we took into consideration the emotion then we yeah. would be able to make a better system absolutely that all yeah. people whose job in the insurance company is to find something to deny coverage to somebody because uh that increases their profit by not paying out trying to find a yeah. loophole and that's an ex that would be yeah. a business logic versus ethics yeah thing. yeah so uh, i <laughs> i agree to that um so Here's, this is a little bit of a digression, but it's, I think it's important. So you relate to Enneagram 2 wing 3. Mm -hmm. um, if you say what you relate to about the 2 and what you relate to about the 3, mm -hmm. those things in there might be important to Victor okay. in socionics terms. Okay. So what I really relate to about the 2 is the core fear of feeling unlovable. And as I kind of was describing in um, my how I grew up, Thing, there's sort of this theme of like I always wanted a best friend and I always would go above and beyond to make friends and make people feel like they like me and I, I took it to heart whenever there were people who didn't like me stuff like that and you know when I got into college I definitely relate to sort of the unhealthy relationship patterns of type twos of sort of there were definitely some people I dated that I kind of thought um Oh, I can help this person. <laughs> I can fix this person. Like, I didn't think that consciously at the time, but you know, looking back and being in a better relationship now, I can say that there was definitely a part of me that was like, oh, I can help you. I, I can, oh, this person just needs love. Like, I like see like the higher potential in people. And, you know, I, you know, the, the helper archetype I relate to. Um, and then as a, as a, the three wing, um, I, my three wing is a lot more obvious now that I'm out of college because the key way that I'm trying to help people I'm realizing is I'm a very entrepreneurial person. I'm very interested in achieving and um, I, I want, I, I guess I want the recognition for all the hard work I do. Um, on a more, I relate to the achieving aspect as well, I guess. But I feel like the root of it is more from the two standpoint. So if that answers your question. Right. I'm just gonna take 10 seconds. So with the healthcare thing, it's because people get the healthcare instead of the wages. And if they got the wages that would be equivalent to the healthcare, that would be taxed. But the healthcare coverage is not taxed and they tend to get the maximum amount of healthcare, then it starts to get overutilized. That's the end of that. So, um, there are three. There are th uh, what do you think of these three words? How important are these three concepts to you? And then I'll get back to the the next question of the initial three of the mm -hmm. first one. 
Um, oh, God. So how important or not is being authentic? Um, very important. Why? Um, <laughs> um, I don't know. Like, can you can you tell me the other words so I can kind of compare them? The the the, the other three, uh, the other two of the three, uh -huh. uh, benevolent and empathic. I think benevolent is the most important, and uh, I would say out of all the three. I'm I am more empathic out of those three, but I think I definitely see the issues with too much empathy. So that's why probably I'm saying being authentic is very important because I think that of all the three, I would say, well, of all the three, I would say being benevolent is the most important. But if I were to describe myself, I'm very, very empathetic. I always know what the other person's feeling, but that's not always useful information. I've, I've learned over the years. Um, it's very hard for me to unplug. So whenever I'm doing something that's authentic, I feel the dissonance of people who, um, you know, don't like that. And that's very hard. But I think that I've learned that at the end of the day, if you are authentic, it actually leads to like long-term happiness and like more, friendships that you know are deeper and it's more like aligned with your you know yourself and happiness so you you ask what are examples of being benevolent yeah i think that's very subjective you know obviously not being malicious um you know having good intentions to me i feel like it's something you can control or at least i'd like to think you could um I guess, I mean, you can control all of those things, but um, you can always take a moment to just sort of check in with yourself and think about if what you're doing is gonna cause harm to others or if you have any ulterior motive or um, malicious motive and, you know, just not, I don't know. So this one here, so I think you said you've got ESFJ sister. Mm -hmm. How do you think you two uh, compare on this? So mm -hmm. th these are these are key words from Kersey, folks. That's why I'm asking how Megan relates to them. So I have to look up the definition. Yeah, beneficence an interesting one. That what's the main difference? I mean, I know what it means, but I don't really know. Well, for me, beneficent is it's like benevolent is like a, a well, we know what benevolent is is like a positive kind-hearted view of towards humanity it's like it's more there in the heart and the feelings and the attitude whereas beneficent is being actively kind towards uh, others yeah i think benevolent is a lot more important to me like like for example i don't really like when people well, like give to charity just so that they can have a tax credit when they don't even yeah. really care about what they're doing. But then you can argue that there's still like a good result. And so I can't get too mad. But uh, yeah, I would rather someone have good intentions. That's, that's actually a really hard question. I don't want to set that in stone that I care more about the intentions. Um, because I go back and forth with like that sort of ethical question because it's really important to do good things as well, but. Um, Just to show the contrast, how do you think your ESFJ sister would so, answer that? I don't know, actually. See, that's actually one of the things with her is that I really understand her and her actions, but she doesn't really share with me how she philosophically um, perceives things. So right. I don't really know. Um, I would say, she would probably say, if I were to ask her this, she would be like, I mean both, aren't those synonyms? She would probably just say those are synonyms. Like, I don't know if she would know the difference or whatever, but I do think that for her, um, it's kind of about doing the right thing and like being the bigger person um, at all 
in any scenario. Yeah. So we've got a little bit off topic here, but I think this is a good question. So for you and her, what would be the difference for when she when she talks about doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. Where is the source of the right thing for her versus the source of the right thing for you? Well, I think that for me, we both want to create a positive impact, but I feel like for her, she could be a little bit more short-sighted in what that means, where I will like try and look at the long-term um, or what's better at the end of the day sort of thing, where for her, I think that she doesn't really like the discomfort of bringing something up in the moment. Um, she would rather just, she's, she's more passive aggressive. <laughs> okay. I'll say she can smooth conflict over very easily but then the same conflict will happen next week and i'm like trying to solve it so that it doesn't happen next week i wonder if victor could type your sister as well from this interview <laughs> right, so, um, so yeah i think i think we've done enough on uh upbringing unless you want to add something more no. about your upbringing no right. so the fine. second part of the first question is oh boy please tell us about <laughs> your education right from the beginning up until present my education yeah what was it yeah lots of detail please i don't know really see that's the thing is, is well, this... like how you did at school all these kind of things uh -oh, how subjects, I all that kind of stuff oh uh, okay okay so um i cared about i did better whenever i cared about the teacher or if i liked the teacher um i did better in classes that I cared about. Um, I didn't really like math or like memorizing my multiplication tables. Um, however, um, I always got good grade. Like I was like a straight A student all through um, elementary, middle and high school. Um, I was not straight A college student, but that's because at that time for me, I was a lot more like, this doesn't matter. I'm just getting my degree. And I like would care way more about the classes that I were, was going to use. But, you know, before then it was all about. Also, I think it had something to do with like just the school district. I was at. I was always naturally smart, I guess. I didn't have to try very much, like at least compared to the school system that I was in, which is very like just completely depends I, um, but I didn't feel challenged very much in school. I, um, always took like AP or advanced level classes if I could. Whenever I was little though, um, I really got into poetry when I was in second grade. I had this huge phase where I like bought a writing dictionary and I wrote like a poet, I wrote poems based on like each of the vowels or whatever. And they were just stupid poems but like I printed them out and I used Microsoft paint to make the cover and I gave them to my family members for Christmas that year. And I remember I got nominated to do like a young writers thing when I was in elementary. So yeah, I guess, you know, I definitely always preferred um, uh, language arts, English, uh, art, honestly, music. I mean, music was my favorite subject I was even a music major for a bit in college. Um, when I switched to journalism in college uh, later on as like sort of a backup because I felt more comfortable in my ability to write. Uh, but yeah, I guess like for math, the thing though is, is that I didn't enjoy it, but I recognized that doing good enough to pass the class was important. And so I would figure it out. Like I preferred algebra way more to geometry but I mean, I even, it wasn't even really that hard. I just didn't really like it. And it was very tedious. Um, and then like, though, okay, when we get to college though, what I absolutely could not stand is when teachers just wanted me to regurgitate facts and remember details of like, oh, like when did they sign this bill? Like in 1890, whatever. I hated that so much. But then the classes that I excelled in the most in college was sociology and philosophy. I got straight A's in all of my philosophy classes because for me it was like they're explaining um, like John Stuart Mill and Kant and then there's like an ethical problem and you're like, okay, which what would they say and what, then what would they say? Like that was very easy for me because I 
had to actually grasp the material. I feel like in other classes where I would try and grasp the material and then the test would be like, oh, they don't even really care if you grasp it. They just want to know if you remember the, the date. <laughs> then I would like feel frustrated because I would have remembered like what I thought was the important part. But I didn't know how to show it. So yeah, it's just a uh, Victor because he might not uh, be aware of the system of making people do these extra courses. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that's, that's actually the thing is that whenever I'm saying I did worse in college <laughs> is that overall, like I had to take, I had to take a food science class to get my science credit. And I, the, the professor just droned on and on with SI, <laughs> like, and I was so bored and I did not care. So like, could I, you, so oh, that's not instruction for me, but could, could you like say which courses you did in like, I like this one. I didn't like this one, that kind okay. of thing. Um, I mean, uh, multimedia planning and design. I really liked, I liked documentary journalism. I liked, um, politics of the American South. I liked epistemology, ethics. Um, I even liked anthropology. It was one of my favorite science class classes I ever took because I had to do like a lab. Um, you know, I, I didn't like history of journalism. Um, it was boring. I mean like history for me, it's very depends on who the teacher is. If the teacher makes it interesting and I get to reflect on it, then I excelled at it. But if it was about memorizing, I didn't really excel at it. If if you had done, say, social history, would that have been interesting to you? Yeah. And so that's why I guess I mentioned a class I did like in college, Politics of the American South. It was It was all about why is the South that way? And let's really look at every single thing that happened that led to this dynamic we see now, that was interesting to me. But whenever there was no real reason why we were learning it, it's like, for me, history is important so that you can not repeat the past uh, and you can like gain ins insights from it. I, this is a good example. I remember even in US history in school, like in high school, I remember asking like, so I'm like, I read the chapter and I'm like, I'm confused. What ended the Great Depression? And they were like, well, some people say it was the war and some people say it was FDR's New Deal. And I'm like, wait, but how do you not know what led to what? Like, I wanted to know, like. <laughs> I'll so, just, yeah, um, I'll just take 10 seconds to say uh, what ended okay. the Great Depression was FDR dying. And then um, well, no, the see, end, end of the more, war. That's your, that's your perspective. Well, like, there's a lot that, that's been no, studied a lot the by Murray Rothbard. The point, anyway, is we won't they, get into that. the point is, is that whatever I learned, it was unclear. And yeah. what my and well, my and I, whatever you want to type me as, what I was looking for was the the train of thought of this leads to this, which leads well, to this. So uh, that was just confusing. I'll just say that <laughs> a few years after Roosevelt died. They passed a constitutional amendment that they didn't want any other president having more than two terms. So they probably wouldn't have done that if people felt it was a great president. No, they actually, wouldn't have passed don't know it. That at all. <laughs> He's my favorite president. So let's well, like I said, these these time. little digressions that are relevant, <laughs> but like that's a whole hangout on itself. Yeah. But like FDR did stupid stuff like. Uh, to protect the farmers, he destroyed food, destroyed cattle, so that the price wouldn't come down that would help poorer people, but it wouldn't have hurt the farmers that much anyway because their prices would have come down. Anyway, anyway, don't want to get distracted onto like these little things that could be a whole series. Well, I can themselves. just say to that, though, really quick, though, that the thing that was stressful for me, though, is that the way that American history is often taught is this is what happened when that's not even really what ha like whatever you're telling me might be just way more context that I was never even taught. I did not even really know. You wouldn't have been taught that. You wouldn't have been taught. I that. did not really know what happened to the Native Americans until 
high school. Like they don't teach that very well. Well, they should. And, yeah. Yeah. They, yeah, they should. But see, it's like, that's what I'm saying. Like I didn't do well with just like, this is how it is. Now remember that. <laughs> like if I would have known the why or like the philosophies going on, then like maybe I would have had a different, different conclusion about things. But anyway, so there's another part of your uh, uh, education. So I think you moved now into a psychology degree. What's that yes. like? Yes, I am. I'm studying a master's in organizational psychology right now. And I'm excited to be able to use psychological um, tools to apply to the workplace and stuff. And my least favorite part about that is the data analysis and the statistics. And my favorite part is that whenever I read studies, I'm really good at coming up with implications to the study in like thinking, um, oh, maybe we should, or I'll like do like a meta analysis of different topics. Like for example, our workplaces do they work better if you have an open office plan or do you have cubicles? Like I'll look into that and I'll notice, okay, these are some things that have not been studied that we should study. Or I'll say like, oh, you can maybe glean this impression from this group of studies. And this is the recommendation I would give to a company. Like that's what is interesting to me. Right, so I was just uh, going on Nia's question mm -hmm. here about like yeah just little follow-up questions little points like for instance when megan said something about um uh there was a word like connection that's something to follow up on because there's an fe kind of connection and there's an fi kind of connection yeah that's important because you know you know mm -hmm. anyhow i won't say why because it's modeling up different systems so the next one uh a little bit personal but uh, mm -hmm. it's part of Victor's system. So what is your career, your work history up till now? Okay. So I worked as a journalist for an online magazine for almost two years. And that was a startup with about five people. And then after that, I left to, um, after that, I went and worked as a content strategist at a startup where that was a little weird because there's eight people and I was the first marketing person that they hired and they kind of wanted me to do everything. I didn't have that much marketing experience, so I had to figure it out. Um, and I was only there for a few months because then they were like, oh, we don't have the money for this because we're not profitable. I guess you could see, you could say the theme is that I did not really want to apply for many corporations. Like, okay, the thing is, is that I want, I, am an intrinsically driven person and I want to work for a place that I care about because that's how I'm going to do my best work. Like the same, the same way that I was explaining how I did better work in college if I cared about the topic. Like I definitely wanted to continue that into my career and I didn't just look at any job that I would be capable of doing because I was thinking, would I be emotionally motivated to do this over time? Like, is that even sustainable? And so if I knew that a job would be completely soul crushing, that I wasn't even going to apply. So I mostly applied to startups or things where the CEO or whoever would, I would be working with had a more innovative, innovative mindset or something that someone I kind of vibed with or felt like I had similar values to them. And uh, so I, after that though, like after, <laughs> after that working at the startup, I guess really, I've been doing freelance side projects ever since I was in college, just for extra money, just like writing things for people. And so after the, my second job, I like decided that I wanted to work at a coffee shop and try and build my freelance um, experience because I realized that what if my job wasn't going, like if my passions couldn't support me fully that I want to make sure that the money coming in and my job supports my passion. And I was wanting to put my passions and my goals first. And I didn't care where the money came from. It had to be at a coffee shop for a while. I didn't really care. So um, I did that for a while. Then I decided to apply 
to go back to school to get a psychology degree because I was sort of like, you know what, I don't want to like pretty much I don't want to market products that don't need to exist in the world. Like <laughs> I, I've, I've worked with people where it's like, this is the next new tech product. And it's like, is it though? Like, I'm sure there's some care. funny ones there, Megan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like like this one it was like a tech product that was supposed to improve communication yet the person who came up with it could not communicate and so i was like asking all these questions i think that what tends to happen in my career is people see my potential or they think i'm a great person and then they realize that it's not super easy to co just convince me to be their little worker bee <laughs> it's not it's not that great because right. I'm, I'm, I will ask a lot of questions like I, I was like how are you doing how are you saying that this technology is helping communication in what way like is it doing this is it doing that like I like will I don't know like uh, oh, here's one good one how has this technology <laughs> enabled you to improve your communication yeah. <laughs> yeah and like I don't know like I just I felt like I self-selected what my options yeah. were based on what I felt was um, I would have the internal emotional motivation to do. And now, you know, I'm doing social media marketing. I just got a new job, but really my goal is to work for myself. Um, doing, I want to write books. I want to be a motivational speaker. I want to continue to do podcasts and YouTube videos. I want to continue to study philosophy and psychology. I want to offer consulting. And I want to sort of, I get uh, what kind of books. Um, I'm mostly interested in uh, Carl Jung's individuation process and uh, self-growth. So, um, yeah. So that's the first question. <laughs> done with and the second question is going to oh be boy. it's another cracker oh boy what are your hobbies and interests okay i feel like i covered this a lot um i mean music was my first love like singing was my first love i still like um theater i listen to a lot of music um uh, also i see zero one affinity infinity says i'm super woo I am as well. I'm very into <laughs> metaphysics. I'm very into spirituality. I read a lot about new thought, um, sort of law of attraction <laughs> stuff. Um, my hobbies are I watch YouTube videos about other people's philosophies. I read. I listen to podcasts. I listen to music. I hang out with my friends. I ask them about, about them. <laughs> and what what they think about things but i like working on projects with people so um uh, like one of my best friends and i are working on a um marketing company that would be sort of tuning into people psychically because we're i'm okay i'm very into metaphysics i don't talk about it much on my channel because i'm kind of thinking of how i want to explain all of that but i guess what am, how do I want to explain this? I don't know how to explain it. I feel like I've already talked about my interests enough. I feel like you guys <laughs> get the idea. Uh, okay. There's no really way to, I don't know. Right. But now you're mainly interested in stuff related to psychology and typology yeah. and personal growth, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. So to the best of your conscience, you have answered that question. I feel about like hobbies yeah, and there's nothing really else I could say. <laughs> and you've mentioned what you're into as a child with the singing and the dancing and the performing yeah. and to be expressive, that sort of thing. So the next mm. question, this is a good one. Uh, what are your strengths? My strengths are um, understanding people communicating my emotions and navigating difficult uh, discussions while remaining respectful. And um, there's an example of that in this hangout when we brought up certain yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Being able to communicate, not just m my value, but see the value in others. I mean, from a economic business sort of perspective, I can help brands or companies communicate their value really well. I'm a pretty strategic thinker. 
Um, I'm not as organized, but I get the main idea of things very quickly and I know how to emotionally impact people. I was good at persuasive essays <laughs> growing up. Um, I, you know, I also did speech and debate. So I also had in high school, I also had to do like speaking. So, um, honestly communicating, um, and, uh, understanding how things land with people. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's the main thing. So, the fourth and final question, and it's a good one. Oh my God, we blow, blew through the last two. I'm well, so you, you've blown through them because you know you, 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 sped, up, you sped it up. Mm -hmm. um, what are your weaknesses? Um, I am very prone to burnout. I am not very detail-oriented. I don't like when people tell me what to do um, at all. <laughs> um, I, it's not just that I feel like, oh, I shouldn't be told what to do. But whenever people tell me what to do and I don't know the why behind it, it's very hard for me to implement whatever they want. So I've actually, the past few years have been probably one, some of the hardest in my life because it's been a really hard, difficult transition to go from being a good student to then trying to be a good entry level employee. And I'm not a very good entry level employee. I'm not very good at just do what I say and don't ask questions and just stay organized and, you know, just make sure you maintain consistent effort. <laughs> I'm not good at that at all. Um, you know, and I wish I was uh, because I also wish that I was able to turn off my emotions about that and just, uh, just get over it, but I can't. I don't know how. <laughs> I uh, everything is. I'm kind of just a drama queen about everything. Um, <laughs> I, um, you know, I am not very tidy. I do not. Um, things pile up. Literally, clean laundry on my bed will pile up for weeks. Um, I can ver very much ignore the anxiety in my body. I can ignore um, if I'm eating right. Um, I can, you know, I just overexert my energy in ways that I don't really know um, my limits, my physical limits, <laughs> you could say. Um, when I was younger, I used to just have a really hard time being alone with my own thoughts and not needing anybody else's um, feedback. Um, I also struggle with if I have um, an unpopular opinion, I feel very uncomfortable by that because on the one hand, I feel like I should share my opinion because it adds to the whole pot of understanding. But on the other, sometimes I feel like it's not gonna do any good by saying it out loud. I will say it if I feel like it will be listened to or if I feel like it will land well or if I feel like I don't have much of a choice or, or like that there's nothing really I can do to eliminate the dissonance. Um, also, when I, I've been in a serious relationship for um, almost two years now. But whenever I was not in a relationship and whenever I was um, like single, I would waste time, waste a lot of time worrying about if somebody was going to text me back or worrying if my dream partner existed. I wasted time going on dates with people I knew I would never want to marry or that I didn't care about. Uh, I would just get distracted from either school or work by figuring out like, I don't know. But you know, the thing I'm proud of myself about is that even with that, even with my obsessive, I guess, wanting people to like me, I don't think that I ever really changed who I am at my core. Um, 
I also, I don't know how to pick my battles or drop it very well. Um, and so I can seem sort of defensive um, if I'm passionate about something because uh, I'm, sen I'm sensitive, I'm very sensitive. And if somebody um, is stomping on my emotions or dismissing my emotions, I can feel it even if it's very slight. Um, and so I think that could be a strength because I'm very sensitive to it, I'm aware of it, but I also can sort of over, um, over inflate the importance of that. Like, for example, like a coworker, um, I just started this job less than a week ago and I can sense a lack of trust between us and it really bothers me. But then I'm like, wait a minute, we just met I could calm down. I could not take that personally, maybe, because when you just meet someone, there's not going to automatically be trust. But, you know, I try and be very warm and create the trust um, because I see that it's useful. So I think that kind of sums it up. Yeah, so we were just <laughs> asking about, um, she came in late and missed what the earlier questions oh, yeah. were about. We spent about 40 minutes on the, on the initial questions. But I think yeah. it was good stuff, though. Try to follow up and please accept my apology for the interruptions. But Oh, no. I get what you mean because I have found even with typing that even though it makes it longer, like the what I mean by the word connection or something really matters and that everybody is going to view that a little differently than others like even like i talked a lot about how i really like to be authentic and that i really am like myself and you know does that mean that i'm an fi user i don't know like like what i mean by that is going to be different and obviously victor will tie me as he wants and i know socionics might be a little different than mbti but that's something that i it's like what i mean by being authentic might be different to different than when if i use things i don't know yeah because it's like what i was thinking about um because because now at the end now i now i can say something for the audience so a lot of the questions i was getting towards mm -hmm. okay if she elaborates on this she might sound more nf or more this or more that ah yeah because nfs whether they're fe or fi they're interested in connection and authenticity and things like yeah. that and mm -hmm. they, they might take different angles on it but um yeah, there we go. There's, there's a question for you. How do you think? Uh, so if you if somebody was looking at this from the outside mm -hmm. and, and they didn't take clubs into account, they might think, why is authenticity important to uh, ENFJ? Uh, because hang on a minute. That's an extra question from Victor. There it is. Why do you think you are EIE? That's it extra question I oh, okay um well i haven't seen any reason why i'm not <laughs> it is one thing um, i haven't either <laughs> <laughs> everything i've read about it seems to make complete sense to me um you know uh i guess i don't know nothing else fits are there is there any there, go ahead is there anything in the beta quadra where mm. it's like you thought oh that's a little bit too much hmm. well i think i told you this before so okay so just background is i found out about type in 2012 and my dad is mbti certified and uh he helped me come to the conclusion that i was an enfj and so I've known I was ENFJ for that long. I probably discovered Socionics in like 2014 or something. But at the time, I um, just assumed I was EIE because the same functions and everything I read in the EIE description was like jaw dropped. It was the best way to describe me I've ever read. Um, that was my initial reaction. I was like, holy shit, this describes every single aspect of me. Sorry, I cursed. It's the only one so far. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, so whenever I started to look at the beta description, I wasn't thinking 
oh, which one do I relate to more? I just assumed that Oceanic says that I'm this, and so I'm going to just enter a thought experiment and see how I might relate to this. But if I would not have just allowed to enter, if I would not have allowed myself to entertain that thought, then maybe I would have thought that I don't relate to aristocratic because I want everybody to be themselves. I want everyone to be equal and all that. And so there might have been some things that I would see about the beta quadra where I might think, oh, well, you know, I don't want to steamroll over anyone. However, I have been told that I do steamroll over people, even though I never intend to. Um, one of my best friends growing up, I believe, is an INFP and also a Delta. And that was one of the main things that we would fight over is that it would seem like I would talk over her or things like that. Or I would like share her business to people where I didn't think that I was sharing anything that was private. Like I never intended to make, I never want anyone to feel that way. Um, can I respond to what the introverted thinker just said? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Susan asked, didn't you make a Facebook post about ENFJ being snobby? Uh, the reason why I said that is I, I realized, well, I was talking about how I think NFJs can be a little snobby culturally. And I guess um, I was just thinking about how my favorite type of music is way more complex than pop music and that I like to think deeper like I was just like sort of thinking things like that and I was like oh my god this is like the epitome of what snob is and like I never am trying to think I'm better than anyone else I still don't but my taste is very like high culture high ref like refined and I feel like that sort of attitude about some NFJs can be kind of annoying <laughs> to people um I don't know because I'm, I'm definitely not classist and I realize that being snobby is different than being classist so, um, um that so I have another question. Uh -huh. So, if willing, when would you like to do a Megan's Best Bit Tri Type hangout event? Um, a Best Tri Type? Yeah. Um, With Jonathan. Like, you're going to get the main, the main person on YouTube who's not a professional Enneagram person. We'd go through various statements. It's nine times mm. 20 statements. So it's going to be an in-depth and it's how Jonathan follows up. And he's the secret source for how he would work mm. out your tri type based mm -hmm. on your answers to the statements. Okay. Um, um, probably in January, but yeah. because yeah, well, yeah, next, yeah, I, it's gotta be. January. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I know from experience, Second half of December, I might as well forget it. Yeah, <laughs> for, pretty much. For, for <laughs> videos. Um, is there anything else? Oh, yeah, one thing I could ask. Um, oh, Nate has a to, good thing. That he yeah, does. go on, Nate, and then I'll ask my question about directive and informal. Um, did you see the comment? That one? Uh, yeah, so beta is inclusive and, ar and aristocratic. So I guess, like... This isn't necessarily me not relating to beta, but I guess anything that is super forceful that I do, I never intend to hurt anyone. And I never intend to be like steamrolling over people or like too much or like conflict, whatever. And so I think that, you know, I have been able to see aspects of myself or my tendencies through just um, being open to what beta says. But that is definitely something that would have been like, hmm, if I wasn't as familiar, if that makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's your most emotional answer in uh, <laughs> this video. I could see that was heartfelt for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, I've got something to show you here about somebody saying about um, mm -hmm. Vita. There's a big difference in how Victor concedes the uh, the functions in terms of. Mm -hmm. Hang on a minute, that's not right. I see minus for. 
That's not right. That's not right. That should be SE Plus. I've made a mistake on the graphic. Uh oh. Well, while you're looking for that, Fate Win says, in yeah. my experience, the most knobby type are ILEs. Um, whenever I was thinking about being snobby, I was talking about NFJs in regards to culture, yeah. emotional taste of like, oh, I like abstract art, like that sort of thing. But I can see that as well. <laughs> yeah, I was very, the, the charges are wrong. So yeah, I've got to change these folks. This should be SE plus. Yeah. Be, the reason why is Victor has, there's a big difference. So people associate beta quadra with power sensing of subordination. And, uh, yeah. but ENFJ is about power sensing of resistance. So it's here. Yeah. Where, um, takes action in protest against any violence and oppression. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. I, I hate, like, I hate like abiding to abiding by authority at all or like anyone abusing their power. Like I will go against that. So the interesting thing, though, is this is one of the things that there's a, there's a very interesting Kersey dichotomy. Um, I like that it says has a yeah. rebel personality because I don't I don't often hear that talked about, and I don't yeah. often think about that aspect of myself. But I think that that's definitely there. So there's a, there's a thing in Kersey which is interesting when it's in relation to NFs. So you, so it's easy to see how guardians are compliant uh, with social norms. Mm -hmm. With NFs, it's a little bit trickier because mm -hmm. um, they have that personal authentic thing. Mm -hmm. Although it does also tend to be a group focus in wanting the harm or harmony and people to come together, things like that. So you started off with Kersey. What mm -hmm. did you think when you read about NFs being cooperative? You know, that was so long ago that I probably, well, like, I would even say I am cooperative, yet I'm also a rebel. Like, I can see both. Yeah. Like, um, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, what? whenever I read the Please Understand Me when I was 17, it just explained why so many of my friends were FPs or they were censors. Like, they're in different temperaments, but also just, like, at the time, my closest friends were INFP and ESFP. And so just reading about the ENFJ profile at the time was already super mind blowing for me to see how I might be different than them. Um, and I am, I'm not not cooperative. Like if something's not gonna work, I might not try it. I mean, it's weird. So even just like protesting, I do see there's a lot of EIEs that I know that protest a lot. Um, yeah. And I have before, but I think because my dad was in politics and I see how this stuff works and like I'm, I am interested in politics, I'm kind of at the point where I don't want to waste my energy. I would rather, I, I would rather put my energy towards something that's going to help. And not that, not that protests don't help. But like I, I have this sort of spirit of wanting to protest, but the way that I do it is kind of different depending on if I think that it's going to matter. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But. Yeah. So I've got to change the charges on there because people can see that the, uh, cause they look minus plus and then this one should be minus plus. Mm -hmm. Oh, right then. So uh, I remember you saying that you've got to do some, uh, Got to do some logistical stuff. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Um, what else is there? We didn't do the main questions. Uh, what does it mean that whenever you asked me to go back in time, I didn't do it in chronological order, no matter how hard I tried? <laughs> when, I did I, when, so when, did, when did I? When did I ask you that? Um, well, about like my childhood and about my education. No, that was fine because it, 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 you you wrote it down and you went back to it and you answered. Yeah, the, uh, it's just so funny to me. I tried so hard to do it in chronological order. 
Yeah, but I think you did it the right way though, because if you'd have answered it right then, you would have distracted yourself from the point that you were making. Yeah. Yep. Oh, right. one of the, one of the things I'd like to do. So mm -hmm. there's an event in January. Hopefully, you could make it. The Carol mm -hmm. Linden, F E and F I language. What time is that? We don't, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. I would like to make it. Yeah. Uh, it would pr probably be on a Saturday. Uh, that's when Carol tends to be free. Um, oh, so Fate just asked a question is about my subtype. Is I, I think you're probably creative subtype. Okay. That's what I think as well. But is... um. Is Victor going to give insight on that as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. He'll do uh, subtype because there's really big differences with subtype. So, for example, if you look at the uh, the uh just the main profile of SEI, have you got mm -hmm. Victor's book? Yes. So if, you, so if you see with SEI, when you look at normalizing SEI, it's like, okay, this is pretty much exactly the same as the Kersey ISFJ. The other subtypes... Just huge differences. Yeah. With it. I really, I just read the entire EIE profile and picked which one I related to. So I might be seeing myself wrong, but the creative subtype, I did feel like I related to it the most. Um, oh, someone's but, asked uh, Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, you've, so DCNH, the dominant subtype, that's a type with. Now, on Wikisocion, it will say this, but I've had a bit of extra theory has been added by Victor. So, basically, the dominant subtype mm. is a little bit EJ, a little bit of the linear assertive Galenko temperament. So, um, that can be shown with functional accentuation, extra TE, mm. extra FE, because those are the EJ mm. functions. Okay. In, in terms of dichotomies, that would be... Uh, a little bit more initiating in social contact. Uh, so that would be, uh, and so that dichotomy is called, actually, that's not right. I use initiating in the wrong sense because it's used differently. Is so creative it, subtype more NE and SE? Yes, but an extra function was added. Oh, okay. So I'll just say what the dichotomies are because we know what the functional it, so dominant subtype is going to be contact rather than distant because you can have uh, socially reserved versions of say an extrovert so mm -hmm. dominant is um contact in terms of human contact it is uh terminating in terms of completing projects rather than initiating them so you mm -hmm. can say the dominant is extra extroverted socially and extra j the p mm -hmm is extra contact uh, and and uh, more initiating rather than uh, terminating so more about starting projects so a little bit more ep-ish so yeah the creative subtype of of eie will, will be a little bit more creative a little bit more like enfp yeah uh, that's true i mean i surround myself with ne doms all the time for whatever reason yeah my friend nate who's commenting was even said something to me today of like, man, how do you have so much of a, well, I don't, can't remember how you worded it, Nate, but a tolerance for any, for any, <laughs> <laughs> you have higher tolerance than for any, but yeah, but, yeah. it also but, annoys me a lot, but. That could be a, that could be an FE thing. True. We're tolerant about a lot of stuff. <laughs> True. And also to Alex who asked about the subtypes, I might be wrong here, but I know Alex is into um, sort of the objective personality type stuff. And I, I feel like there might be some sort of correlations of the animals of blast, play, sleep, consume in Dave's system and the subtypes. Yes. Like, like yeah, I it, think that those might correlate a little. Because yeah, yeah, the subtypes, is, is the because it's like an extension of Victor's. I call them mindset so as not to mix them up with mm -hmm. the Kersey temperaments. So anyway, so this is this is information I got from Wikisocion a few years ago. When I did, people should know, I did three videos with Victor Galenko on DCNH. Mm -hmm. there, so, and in those videos, he said that from his research or from experience, he added some extra functions. So, SE okay. was added to dominant. 
So okay. he found that the dominant subtypes not only tended to have extra FE and TE, so it's, it's probably a case of FE and or TE and or SE. So you can mm -hmm. imagine dominant subtype of SIE will have extra SE. Mm -hmm. uh, creative subtype, he added, and you'll like this, Megan, FE to the creative okay. subtype. Mm -hmm. uh, and to normalize him, he, had, he added SI. Mm -hmm. And to harmonizing, he added, added FI. Ah, uh, yeah. I think I have an EIE friend who is harmonizing subtype. And that makes sense, if that's the case, about the FI thing. Right. But, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so, so a, a, a little bit of uh, interest. Do you know this, Alexandra? Dang person, yeah. Megan? Mm -hmm. Has she been on your channel? You know, not yet. But um, Alex is active in my Facebook group as one of my mods. So, INTJ, how's it going? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I could send it. I could send her the Model G profile. Mm -hmm. Right then. Yeah. Um, yes. One of the things it might be possible to have Dario attend the FE FI video with Carol Linden. So I guess can we January. can we tell everyone the next steps of this victory? Very, very good, very good. Yes. <laughs> um, so the next because I probably should wrap this up, but yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I will say what the next step is, and then yes, Megan can do her logistics. Um, <laughs> the next step. <laughs> you will Sorry. trans. You will kindly transcribe this with your software, or your software yeah. will kindly transcribe it. I will do that for you, but would would you be able to go through and edit out like ums or or would you be able to edit out things that are maybe unimportant? Or all of it's important. All of it is. <laughs> I'm okay. not gonna. Gotcha. I'm not gonna edit it. To be honest, okay. that's, that's, that's too much fine. work. That's okay. honestly that is that's that is too much. That is fine. As, if, as long as it I works did, for purposes. I, I did it one time transcribing. It took ages. Yeah. Because. Yeah, it, it, it's best to keep it raw, unfiltered. Uh, also, mm -hmm. so once it's because Victor understands some English, but it depends mm -hmm. on the on the accent. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't understand Jonathan, even though they're English English language doms. So we say, are they? Is he going to be looking at my facial expressions too? Yeah, now that it's finished, yes, he is. That's why I, that's why yeah. I didn't want to tell you about what his methods were because I didn't want you to F -E him. Um, yeah. Also, I didn't want to tell you because he wanted the live reaction to the questions. So mm -hmm. what did you think of the questions? I really liked them. I do think that I don't know if this is just my perception but I feel like it required maybe more SI for me than what I feel naturally capable of doing. Um, I kind of felt myself straining to try and remember things a lot. Um, yeah, you did you well. You, things, got, you got onto a roll when it was emotional. If it was a memory yeah. and your face lit up, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's just sort of the thing is that you need to get the, the whole scope. I like the topics, but I think that there could be more pointed questions to make sure that I get, I give you the information that you're looking for because sometimes if it seemed so vague, I just didn't know, but maybe that's the point. Maybe yeah, you I want, mean, yeah. That, I'm very much more of the technique of you don't grill people in an interview. It doesn't work. It makes people defensive. There's a, mm -hmm. there's a, there's an American expat living in England called Ruby Wax. She had a psychology degree. She had this whole series called Ruby Wax Meets, mm -hmm. where she would befriend a Hollywood celebrity or mm -hmm. Imelda Marcos, mm -hmm. and she would they would just get and she would just get them to admit things to her. Or she had a series where she would talk to these celebrities over dinner, get them liquored up, get them where mm -hmm. they loosen their tongues. And so she got and she said what she did with Imelda Marcos was treat her like an eight year old little girl and give her loads of praise. And she showed her the shoes. Mm -hmm. on her shoe collection. So actually I think I know a way that maybe can help. So so Mike said 
I agree. Maybe the interview questions could be more specific. I think a way that you can make get what you want, which is still getting the vagueness, yet also helping, is what helped me is when you were like, when you said, talk about your education. Like if you were able to say some sort of subcategories of like, what sort of, what sort of classes did you like? Like, like anything like kind of as like little examples or like sub things that I can touch on. I don't know how to ask, ask that, but like, yeah, yeah, it's, um, well, if I was able to follow up though, so it's a case of having a vague okay. question, being able to, uh, follow up and, uh, I don't know. I was trying to meet in the middle. Yeah, it's kind of a thing. It's not, well, you, you don't want to be too leading. Yeah, and yeah. So, so for example, with with education, you might maybe interviewing somebody who has educated themselves, and so mm, if you say mm. classes, true. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. So we're going to do the thing with Dario folks where um, mm -hmm. initially it was just going to be, and then I thought, oh, I'll invite Dario. I'll take a punt so you can. Uh, Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I'll just invite him. I took them and they thought, yes, I'm free. I can join. Brilliant. So he's due to join. He might not join, but he, he's likely to join. So we're going to mm -hmm. go through, discuss. Megan's going to get the full treatment. So she's going to get Victor's oh, type yeah. diagnosis. And uh, Dario is going to be there. There's only, I can, as the host, I can only have five, five guests, six on screen if I take myself out of the picture literally and I, so I'm, i will do that in order to get julia in because julia is a neuroscientist she works on neurodegenerative uh diseases mm -hmm. and um so are you going to ask dario to sort of go into what he sees from my brain as well because yeah yeah, yeah. okay well that's yeah, you, amazing you're gonna because, get the works <laughs> because i have the report but the report doesn't have the personality type info on the same report. And so that's what I've had to read his book and then compare my report. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And then, uh, and then in terms of the, uh, what I was thinking of asking Dario, mm -hmm. uh, in it, if he, if he attends the FE and FI, Mm -hmm. event with cow also planned for january it's a jam-packed january mm -hmm. folks in terms of plans let's see if they come to fruition and that is dario has talked a lot about uh development of functions so mm -hmm. i'm wondering if you have somebody with intj preferences so mm -hmm. ili and socionics and i'm going to stick to mm -hmm. that and uh lii and intp preferences in his system the Baron's Nardi system. Mm -hmm. Will if they are equally motivated to improve FE stuff, will there still be a difference in them? And do those differences support the idea of functions? So wait, you mean both Victor and Dario are both equally motivated to improve FE stuff? No, no, no. It's it's or... about it's about it's because. Well, this would be an event without Victor in it, but maybe you could come in for the sequel because we could mm. make it maybe maybe three on FE and FI. Because mm. Carol is a communication expert. She has Even a website called... Yeah. And that's why I think you would go so well with Carol because mm -hmm. you have complimentary... I'm excited to meet her, yeah. Yeah. So, effectivewithpeople.com. Uh, mm -hmm. So... So it's about how to communicate with FE and FI. Dario is mm -hmm. somebody with INTJ preferences, but has studied mm -hmm. NLP from before 1999. And he mm -hmm. has developed skilled use in the things that we put in the FE box in terms of people skills. But yeah. So what, what I'm sort it's of looking at is <laughs> the difference between, yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> the, the, the difference between natural skilled use and developed skilled use and is there a difference that he's noticed in say how intj resemblers and intp resemblers 
can. That's what I was saying about. That is be- what's so interesting to me is that the behavior can change, but it still is not right. the same in right. my eyes. So what it might be is you might have a situation where INTJ, where an INTJ resembler is equally motivated as an INTP resembler to improve people skills, but for different reasons. INTJ yeah. is thinking, I need a better reputation and all of this stuff. Yeah. There's still going to be that in, in innate directive nature within mm-hmm. INTJ, and there's going to mm-hmm. be an innate uh, accommodating nature inside INTP. One of the interesting yep. things to consider, and, and I'll, just a little sideline for folks. So mm-hmm. Victor's got this DCNH system. And especially if you look at certain subtypes like dominant versus harmonizer. Mm-hmm. And you've got a little bit of that in uh, the Linda Bowen's interaction styles, which are slightly different in context from the Kersey interaction styles. I asked his son, what are they called? He didn't actually have a name for them because they're embedded within the temperament mm-hmm. thing. Where if, you, so for example, Megan, as someone who resembles ENFJ, is predisposed to the role of mentoring, and that's what she does via her channel. Yeah, you mentor a group of people, whereas someone with who, who is more like INFJ, the more reserved, they still wish to mentor people, so they still have that natural predisposition towards counseling people. Yeah, that's actually something that I've realized for me is that I really like helping people one on one, but not nearly as much as I like helping more people and i realized when i think about the trajectory of my career is that i don't want to get stuck in the day-to-day of helping this person and this person this person i want it i like when it's more macro um so that's why i thought of things like books and speaking because um yeah like kind of i would like a combo of that but right yeah. So, Alexandra, I've got some Facebook groups, and we're going to do an OP event on Sunday. So, uh, I've got uh, an Enneagram group called um, A Modest Enneagram uh, Society. We don't even use the the. <laughs> it's just A Modest Enneagram. And I've got Model G and Humanitarian Socionic Society and Kersey Bowen's Appreciation Society. And uh, Do you have your Facebook groups listed below in all of your videos? No, I have them listed in the About tab. You, uh, should, you should list them below in every video just because you never know. All right, then I will, I will defer to your, um, not only your greater <laughs> FE, but your greater yeah. experience in this area. Yeah. Um, I, so, and yeah. so I always pitch people at the end of my videos because I'm afraid to do it at the beginning. And I, and I tell myself, I'm like, if you guys listen to me ramble for this long, then I guess you can't be too mad if I tell you this. Like, that's like what I tell, what I tell myself at least. Right. <laughs> So you're welcome to join my Facebook groups, Alexandria, and uh, be around for the uh, live stream on Sunday at, hang on a minute, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So what I was saying is about subtype. So recently mm-hmm. I was uh, communicating with an INTP resembling female, mm-hmm. and initially I thought, okay, she's really INTP here, mm-hmm. right? very much like it and then we went through the kersey temperament and interaction style and interestingly enough she picked one of the directive roles so i thought hang on a minute that's a little bit interesting there that seems to contradict it so what you got to do then then folks is you got to follow up you got to follow on it and what it what it's like because when you look at the dominant subtype of lii it's not dominant in the way that you expect Mm. inside because victor writes about the lii the dominant lii is it appears dominant but inside it's like feels the stress and all of these stuff and the anxiety so it's a little bit like the counterphobic thing Mm. so looking at interaction style you got to be very careful with with looking at something like this so where you might think okay Is this person directive or are they just a dominant subtype? Mm. 
-hmm. and so looking at those because you can type people quite well so um th this would be an example and this is where all the systems come into play so you could type so it, very early into this interview people should have picked up the nf from megan and oh she's expressive so it's then you're going to go so you're going to go enfp mm -hmm. enfj uh that you can see may, may, certain functions may have been harder to see um but in terms of deciding between enfp and enfj then you start looking at that's pretty much what i was between whenever yeah. i was first trying to type myself so and and so then with interaction style is so for example trying to tell the difference between say enfp dominant an ENFJ mm -hmm. might be quite difficult, uh, mm -hmm. but it's going to be looking at. I would imagine that ENFP dominant would be dominant in slightly different circumstances from ENFJ and for different ends. I would imagine a dominant subtype of ENFP would be about uh, really being about their own freedom and resisting being controlled that might start it off mm. uh, but then i guess on the same token if me being a creative subtype would that make me look p like or you something could, that's the thing that's because the thing for me i do i do juggle multiple projects at once and i do uh start things and then quit them but for me it's about is this going to sustain in the long term right and it's about refining what my long term is i'm totally okay with dropping things not everything has to work as an idea but as long as my goal is to like fine so if, if someone's typing somebody like that mm -hmm. and somebody says oh i do do many things at the same time yeah uh, my suggestion is to folks to follow up is that yeah. the person's preference or is just life forcing them to do many things That's at the same so time that's so true. And I actually, I did a video a year ago whenever I was working at the coffee shop and having all these different freelance jobs. And I was talking about how I feel like life has been forcing me to act like an ENFP or like using more NE, but that I was stressed out and that I want to know what tomorrow is going to look like. And like, I will do this for the time being if it means that I'm going to have a more a better foundation for my career where I feel like I have more control, but it's like, that's not fun for me. And that's, that's, I guess the important thing <laughs> to really look at, I would say. So when you transcribe this, please do the whole thing because that bit right there is important yeah. for, I'm not going to let you into, well, I just, no. Uh, anyway, so there's certain things that might come up in your type diagnosis between what you say versus your eye movements and mm. how victor rationalizes that will be interesting and be actually my, what my what my eeg scan says that i don't know if you saw this but something that daria mentioned is that what was kind of strange is that my natural skills were different than my active skills which suggested that i'm like actively stretching my brain to different parts no so so i don't know how that would have something to do with it but it's kind of what I talked to you about previously, not not on the video, but about sort of like the idea that when someone's aware of their type, how does that change the way they act? Because if you're aware that you have a type, <laughs> then you might yeah. consciously try and, yeah. I don't know. And but. it's not just that as well. It's also, so for example, I, I can give an extreme example. An yeah. ESTP that's into typology, is probably atypical of their type. Mm -hmm. So an NF that's interested in typology is probably not going to be as atypical of their type as say mm -hmm. someone like Julia, uh, ESFJ preferences. So there's being interested in the first place is might make you atypical of your type. Mm -hmm. Second one is knowing about your type. And I would always, mm -hmm. one thing to ask people, especially important to ask sensing types why are they interested in typology mm -hmm. and a lot of it will be for sfs 
it's going to be fe feeling reasons to understand I actually, people. I actually ask people that question uh, when I type them is why they're interested and also what do you think I, I said if you were to do this more like I, for a living what would it be for or like what would you use typology for uh i would i think nia here has um mm -hmm. enfj uh mm -hmm. preferences i think she's in mexico mm -hmm. and or, do you is that do you agree with that because i mean i would say i'm um I'm individualist in some senses yes but but certain certain super, certain types are already pretty individualist so for example would you say eie already is or not really because i can see reasons for both we said this this is this is one of these things which is is mm -hmm. tricky with uh especially with that type because it is an initiator that's Kurz's version of in charge so you might have a situation like this they are cooperative in the way that they lead the group and mm. they might shape the group to their individual vision that they think is the best for the group and other things so they can mm -hmm. have an individual collective vision that they shape and share with other people so but and then the way that comes out mental health is going to be involved to see how much they are about the movement or how much are they about the movement being a vehicle for their own self progression so mental health mm -hmm. very much affects and i've come to the conclusion over the last few months over the last year that mental health very much affects use of the feeling functions mm -hmm. like you could very much. Have a jerk you could have a jerk intp and a non-jerk intp and it's not really yep. affect their ti use okay true well maybe i i i would just say that a jerk intp probably is not even aware of the ways that their emotions are impacting their logic at the time so you could say that they're still going to have good ti but what i what i've noticed at least is that sometimes there's like a clear emotional motive or clear to ah, me that's a good point. Of why they're acting that way and they can rationalize it and sure it's a valid reasoning but i sometimes will question like is that really the reason for you or is it because you're scared or like something like that where they might not be aware that's a good point where mm -hmm. their actual reasoning would be just as valid but it's that thing that we touched on before about valid versus sound oh, where their yeah. premises being subjective could be influenced by their emotions yes yes i um, do think that a, a jerk INTP with low mental health would probably still be very logically consistent. Yeah. But but maybe that's the valid versus sound is like, yes, it's consistent, but like how accurate is it? I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, what I'll say um, for others is so there's a thing, folks, where you can have premises and all of the logic based on those premises can be internally consistent and brilliant. The premises can be wrong but all of the internal consistency. So for example, imagine a science fiction thing where the premise is like iffy science, but it's just worked out brilliantly. So you can say that's internally valid, but it's not sound. For something to be sound, it has to be internally consistent, valid, and the premises have to be true. And so this is one of the things that people look at in the definition of TI where they 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 need to like split it up but i won't get into that you'll see other mm. videos for that i always go back yeah. to that we probably should uh should wrap up i kind of yes we'll, i will wrap up and just so. as cross-eyed mary has appeared and um i was very very happy when she said that uh mm. she was she was um she had now seen the kersey light <laughs> Oh, nice. Because I like to promote Kersey because hardly anybody else does. Uh, except it's just me and Jeff. I, yeah, I think, I think that because Kersey seemed to maybe want to simplify things or can make it easy to understand compared to other type systems, I don't know. I think people can assume that 
everything is like diluted and that it's more simple. Well, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll just say then before we stop is that because Kersey can be understood on a simple level, people think it's simple. But there's actually loads yeah. of stuff with motivation. It's actually really difficult to make typology sound very simple. Like the more simple you make it, you can assume there's no thought behind it, right. but it's actually really hard to do that. So what I'll say, and I'll, and I'll finish with this. So people think that's simple. Well, in personology has worked out. He was INTP was Kersey senior. And so is his son. And his son is working on a, unified theory of physics so he's really intp and victor typed him as lii so they had conversations for about 40 years so what i'll say is he's got word usage for nts factorial analytic and deductive and in his section about analytic he's got reference factors and all of this stuff and so it's a brilliant way of judging someone's ti by looking at how they use the language in terms of fact factors. So it's like, I'll say something like, oh, but what about this factor and this factor and this factor and this is relevant to this and what are you referring to? And so it's like, and yet you could just have a small definition of TI versus you've got about 15 pages here on NT word usage and about seven pages on factorial. So there you wow. go, folks. So it, well, it, it depends yeah. on the depth. If people want if people want a book where it's like, oh, this is good because it's hard to understand, therefore it's deep, get personology. This was written pretty much just for INTPs. That's what the review said on Amazon. <laughs> Only buy this book if you're an INTP or if you know a lot about typology. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's that's fair because yeah. Because when you're first learn, like at least for me, when I was first learning about it, I wanted to connect with it, you know. But now I find myself when I read typology books, I'm thinking, hmm, why do they choose that word and not this word? Because I'm thinking about how am I going to use this for my own explaining, or like maybe I want to make a video about it. I'm like looking at it way differently. But right. anyway, uh, um, so we're going to stop in a moment. But there's an example of what the book gets like. There you go, reference factors and diagrams. And, and and there was me going INTP on his INTP by correcting his when he's made mistakes. So uh, and we've got <laughs> all this kind of INTP stuff. And I'm going to show one more graphic of what you get with the profiles. And so you get like intelligent actions and then I've INTP'd it all up. And uh, there's a bit at the end. So he has this interesting theory of how well people can do certain things. And yeah. actually, sometimes, ah, this explains double conflictors. So, for example, it is my contention that INFP and ESTP conflict more than INTP and ESFP. Mm. Because ESFP is not trying to dominate the INTP. Mm. ESFP is more about freedom. And also, both of them are, are, both of them are adaptive and both of them are utilitarian. Whereas... Uh, in interaction style, INTP is, INFP is completely different from, e, from ESTP. We have to finish now. Megan has to yeah. do her logistics. So if you yes. want to wind up, Megan. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for all of your different sources and like making me want to read all these books. And yeah, thank you guys all <laughs> for watching. It's really interesting to me to think about how different types or whatever or different type systems categorize things. So there's definitely a lot more out there than just whatever the only type system you read on the internet. There are, you know, lots of different yeah. stuff. So yes, anyway. so I'm going to press stop. All right. <laughs> bye -bye. Well, thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching. Yeah. All right, I'll talk to you later.